Um, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I can just skip some of the slides. I, I don't know when they're going to come up and unfortunately I have to listen to my voice. Um, when my nephew asked me to present something, I straight away thought about the RENA um, socio-cultural impact report that I did because it's the best research. I've enjoyed this research so much, even though it was over 10 years ago now, nearly 10 years ago. And um, then I had to think, well, why did I enjoy it so much? I ha I've got to look as if I got something to tell you, apart from me li liking it. And um, so I'll just see if I can get down to the next one. Uh, and we'll go from there. What a blow. I had a bit of a picture anyway. So, um, Kua Mamai Te Ngākau is a title I got from a rangatahi who had um, sent this message out on his, I think on his phone or on Facebook or something. And I thought it was really appropriate. He said, our moana is suffering after years of sustaining our well-beings, our wairua, whānau, tēnana, hauora. It's our life force, our provider of good health. We look after it. It looks after us. The taitama wahine is uh, taking a battering. Kei te tangi te tai, kei te tangi hoki a hau. And that basically was the feeling when the rena hit the reef at the time of everybody. Um, so the way I'm going to do, do my presentation is that I'm going to divide into three sections. I'm going to give you some givens, that some facts that will background the information that I'm going to talk about. The middle part is going to be uh, four, four um, discoveries I made through doing the research and I really think they were really important. To me, they were important. As a person who, who um, fills the gap in, in um, kaitiaki tangi, so you'll see me make the submissions because nobody else is going to, or who, um, who will um, make the submission to a plan, those sorts of things, who will do a report for free that will advance um, our, our rights and justice for our people. Uh, so that's sort of where I fit in, mostly with my kaitiakitanga, to fill those gaps because nobody else is doing it, generally. So this cultural impact report has got to be interpreted in the context, this is some of the givens, of the desecration of our estuary o Ngātoro by the New Zealand government in 1956-1958, uh, they diverted the Kaituna River away from the estuary without our permission. But I hear it did happen over a lot of places, so that's going there. Thank you. That's Ongatoro. That's um, Makatu Estuary. The name Ongatoro comes from Ngatoroirangi, the Tohunga. Um, I'll come to a bit, bit further on. So just some of the givens again. The Rena ship collided here with a partially submerged moinga called Otaiti on Wednesday, 5th October, 2.20am, while sailing from Napier to Tauranga. And the ship I've highlighted there was carrying containers, eight of which were contained hazardous materials as well as 1,700 tonnes of heavy fuel oil and 200 tonnes of marine diesel. Or Taiti, the Maunga crashed into, or, or Astrolab Reef, is 7.3 k's from Motiti Island, 22 k's away from Makatu, and 24 from Tauranga. And Or Taiti was named by the ancestor Ngātaroirangi as well. O, o Ngātoro Makatu Estuary is named after him. There are elements of tapu in our experience of the disaster. I think um, they've been the hardest parts to tr 
try and deal with or to explain because if you're not on a certain level and if, you'd, if you're not au fait with the um, tapu of Ngātaruirangi, it would be harder for you to understand, in my opinion. But there were elements of tapu in our experience of the disaster. And the collision um, was supposed to be the worst environmental disaster in Aotearoa. And that's some of the oil on Papamore Beach when it first hit there. Sad, it was a sad. And that's another picture. And I think this picture you can see the waves, the waves have come in and, and bring in the oil with them. So this is Papamore Beach, which had, which had the most oil, but it's quite a, um, a long, flat beach. Um, and then again, some of the givens here is that this is the timetable of the disaster so on 9th of October a slick was seen leaving the ship and heading towards Makatū just on the water um, and then on the 10th a maritime New Zealand reported where the, where the oil had been and told people not to go to the beaches and they had identified the most sensitive sites along the coast and Makatū was included. On the 11th of October, there was training uh, initiated by Pia and my son. Pia is my daughter, my son, from the New Zealand Army. The New Zealand Army by that time was on the beaches cleaning. 12th of October, there was a public hui held at Makatū Fire Brigade and I, um, I attended and and that's, there's a message there about why hold it at the fire brigade when the majority of the population is Māori and the Marae's down the road and can hold more people. And at the fire brigade, there were people outside they couldn't fit in. Um, but there's a message about why the fire brigades, but not the Marae. Um, and so all those people were there. And I see Chris Battersall, Professor Chris Battersall, who's attending today, he was at that meeting. And I looked at that meeting, I thought, Right, I said, to, I stood up and said, Tang Defina, we've got to go back to the Marae and deal with some cultural issues here. I didn't want to say, no, Pākehā people aren't allowed. I, so I just said, Tang Defina, we've got cultural issues. So I went, but left and I went back to the Marae at that stage and I sat there by myself, for, I thought, for a long time. And I thought, I wonder if anyone's going to come. And then the people started coming. And I said to the people, right, this is what's going to happen. We're going to take charge. We're going to be in charge of this. And Elaine Tapsell, you're going to be the administrator. Pia Bennett, you're going to be out in the field and you organise. And that's how we went. So I've got the stats there. And so those are, those are the, some of the stats from our clean-up committee. Those aren't all of them. So we trained... Um, what we'd do is that we'd determine when low tide was and we'd clean uh, two hours before and two hours after low tide and people would come to the marae. They come, if they weren't trained, they came a half an hour early, we'd train them, kit them and they'd go out. Um, and then the cooks, and I mostly cooked in the kitchen, you'd see how many people you had to cater for. It was quite an easy process really you'd see and to start with we'd rush to town buy the sausages or something to cook come back and cook it because nobody came to help us we just did it um i went to alaska after this i was, I, I just needed to follow it up and i went to alaska and um one of our mates had come down with his little truck and brought us some gears from tauranga headquarters so i think some white suits not much when I went to Alaska, I was speaking to the mayor of Cordova and he said, and how did you fellas cope? You know, and I said, oh, we had a mate come down with his truck. And he said, we should have done that. Then it went around town how we'd got this mate with his truck to bring us all the gear. And the people in Cordova, the Inuit people, were saying they should have done the same. Well, I didn't want to disappoint them, say, well, it was only a little ute, really. They thought it was a huge truck with all the gear. 
I'll let them think that then. Um, so we, so we, I don't know how many meals we cooked, but it, what happened was, we, this is how we dealt with it. So they'd go out, they'd come back in, we'd have the meal cooked for them, they'd have a meal and they'd sit and they'd unwind. And that was the real good part of it. So every day they had someone to talk to, other, other people, and they'd unwind. And we had people from, we had Hawaiians, we had Tahitians, we had Germans, and we'd say to them, no, you fellas go and enjoy your holiday. Don't come and, you know, help us. And they said they couldn't enjoy their holiday if they didn't help us. And, and so we had this marvellous support. Um, people, I think it was because it was at the marae and that they experienced the monarchy. And they came from all over. Um, Aotearoa and, and did that and then we'd, some of our people would billet them um, Elaine who appointed to be the coordinator uh, the admin coordinator she used the Tapsil Whakapapa to make them all come and she had a, a relation in Auckland who'd come down every weekend in his van and on the way up he'd pick up hitchhikers and the hitchhikers would end up at Makatu cleaning <laughs> so it, there were funny parts to it you know you, you, you had to laugh so now I'm just uh, yeah, so that is that. So we were responsible um, for 80 kilometres of beach line, including two estuaries. So um, those are the given. So we have um, a desecrated estuary. We have um, the Tohunga Ngatarurangi. Ngatarurangi was a very tapu man. He um, he was the navigator of the Te Arawa Waka. Um, he lived on Motiti, and our, our, our locals, our fishermen still say today that there are parts on Motiti that they won't dive because they can feel his presence still. So his mana and tapu is still alive. Um, and he's an, uh, he was an integral part of, of how we operated. Um, so in my report, I compared the experiences we had with Matakan Islanders, Motiti Islanders, and the Inuit of the Prince William Sound area of Alaska. And that's the place where the Exxon Valdez oil tanker went aground. There were so, a lot of social impact reports done for that catastrophe, but I, I think I only saw one for here, for um, the Rena. And um, there's evidence to say that the priority for New Zealand authorities were clearly the birds, animals, and then business people. So the birds had a lot of plans and money spent on them, as the, as did the animals, and then the business people got um, uh, subsidies or reimbursements if they weren't so in a certain distance of the, um, any, any activity to do with the rena. And then we had the um, Matakana Islanders, you know, and this is quite sad stuff. They really, you know, and they said if we didn't have the dotterels here, because there are dotterels here, nobody would have worried about us. They, w they were more interested in saving the birds than helping the people. And then Motiti Island Kuya, she said the birds get more attention than the people. And she said that in an, another venue. And um, she had been part of a um, establishment that just established a kura kaupapa Māori on, on Motiti Island and they had to vacate. You know, so there were all those people impacts that nobody saw. And Tahu Whakatiki Marae opened their marae to a housing during that time while they tried to keep their kura going and and so and and that's w when I visited them that's what they said to me the birds get more attention than them than the people and then this is what the native Alaskans said so I'll let you read this
So it's really um, significant, I think, that three indigenous groups are talking about the people being neglected. So three groups of indigenous peoples talking about it. So another thing that I discovered with the research, so when you're doing research um, you know, in an environmental disaster, you have to have some data on what the environment was like pre the um, catastrophe or the disaster. And um, what I discovered was that the Makatu diversion of, our, of the river from our estuary had actually caused the same social impacts that had happened to the um, Inuit people in Alaska. So our impacts from having our river diverted were exactly the same as what the Inuit people experienced after the Exxon Valdez. Um, so when the oil hit Makatu beaches, the environment and tangata whenua were already in a vulnerable state due to the accumulated effects of the past. So the Kaituna diversion consequences are succinctly captured by the Evos oil spill literature. Um, another part of the research. So we did a victim impacts report to the court, we the ship's captain and mate. We actually held at a marae, a marae justice um, ceremony, I suppose you could say, with, with the captain and the mate and they came with their lawyers. And um, and, and, all, and was really good, it was it was really good to heal that part or to start healing. And so they came there. And I remember someone from, um, I th he was Motiti Island, and he was looked at them and he said to them, my ancestors came here in a wooden boat they carved themselves and they didn't bang into Otaiti, so how come you did? You know, and it, there was that sort of humour. And then um, we were ending up with... Um, saying, well, have you any got any daughters you can marry to some of our boys here? And just things like that, real mar marae stuff. Um, but it, it needed to happen, it needed to happen. Now, the victim impact report was done before we had done the research on the um, cultural impacts research, before we'd gone to the um, EVOS literature. So this was quite disconnected from the research that followed. And this is um, paragraph 19 that we said. So we take this opportunity to acknowledge the guilty pleas given by the captain and the first mate. We think our ancestors would not want us to be gen vengeful. We are pleased that the captain and first mate took ownership of their mistakes we recognise that in the scheme of things they are only a small part of this catastrophe and are easy targets. For Makatu, the diversion of the Kaituna River out through the Tutumukat has been a worse environmental disaster. The New Zealand government did that to us, not a ship's captain, but they have not pleaded guilty or offered a remedy or restoration and it's ironic that they now can put so much blame on these two men. These men have families who depend on them. We accept their guilty plea as acknowledging the mistake. We do not support a prison sentence being issued. And that was done before the, that was done to send to the court to support. Um, and, um, the message there really is compared to what the New Zealand government have done to us, this is nothing. So the next thing was the social, um, oh, I did that one, sorry. The social research. 
So um, the Exxon Valdez disaster had a lot of um, top research done and the, it provided proof, and this is really good stuff for you if you have to make submissions, especially around the sea. This, this is good stuff for you, especially for impacts on, on Indigenous peoples, on Māori. So the research there proved that Indigenous peoples feel the impacts of environmental technological disasters more intensely and longer than non-Indigenous peoples. Um, and and uh, like there I've said, that's stuff that you can use. It was a longitudinal uh, research of 10 years, so it's got um, done by a professor or overseen by a professor, so it's got mana and it proves, and we all have thought that that was the case, but we've never had the proof. And that should be used by people. That when the government, or anybody, might be your friend Shane Jones, is wrecking our environment, this, is, this can be used as proof of the negative psychological social impacts on Māori. So that research validated all those prior tangata whenua um, submissions. Gee, I need to keep up with it, don't I? To our knowledge, it's never been appropriately received by the same authorities. So some of the impacts from the research that was done um, in the Ex Exxon Valdez says that some of the impacts were changes in personal and cultural identity. I can see these things in my village in Makatu. And no one can make me out to be a liar. I know that this is our Makatu situation. Before the river was diverted, we didn't have gangs in Makatu. And the, as the water stopped coming to the estuary, as the, as the environment and the estuary started degrading more and more, the gangs grew more and more in Makatu. And we have the split in Makatu. So on the one hand, You've got some of my family, I have to admit, colonised to the max, tick all the council government boxes, always look for government council approval. And then on this end, we've got the mongrel mob, built a two-storey building without a council permit, and it's more or less to try and take us to court. So, and that's our community. It's really almost dysfunctional. So there's social disruption of community activities and processes, yes. Disruption of function and activities of governance, institution and processes. I don't know, we'd, we're not governance people. Fiscal damages to individuals and institutions. There's loss of valued cum communal solidarity, that's us. Alienation of cultural values and social processes that make our lifestyles meaningful. And changes in sharing and visiting that reinforce social bonds. All those are makatū. Um, also um, proven by the Exxon Valdez research. So, predominant outcomes. So if I was going to give you a, um, an academic outcome or academic results, I'd say this. That the validation of what it was a validation of what we knew about ourselves and our environment, it, that our cultural impact research validated our indigeneity. It, it told us that the Kaituna diversion, like the Rena, like the um, Exxon Valdez, was a technical logical disaster. And it's interesting that again, I think so, Exxon Valdez. Um, research said that people can um, get over reasonably well natural disasters like an earthquake, a tsunami, an eruption, all those things that happened in Cordova. But this one, but the Exxon Valdez, the technological disaster, man-made disasters 
are really hard to get over. Um, so we got confirmation of the serious negative cultural impacts of the diversion and we got validation of the autonomous approach to the Rena oil cleanup by Makatū. So we took over all the cleaning and the management of Makatū. Like the 50 days of cleaning up the oil, continuous, was like a 50 day long tangi. It was really tiring, but we weren't going to let anybody boss us around. I remember um, they came down to put booms in the estuary and our locals said, no, don't put it there, put it over here, this is a better place. And they just ignored us. And I said, oh, well, we'll just wait. So as soon as they went, we shifted them. <laughs> and, that, and, you know, we, that's the sort of thing we did. Um, and then um, we never got any help. We, the help came from locals. Um, AFCO, I remember, gave us boots, you know, from staff that had left. So all the leftover white boots we had to clear for people to wear out on the beach. And um, Bunnings gave us rakes. And about the third day, um, Te Puni Kōkiri, or the Ministry of Māori Development, rang, rang us up and asked us to do a stock take. I said, you come and do it, we're too busy. And anyway, you haven't given us anything. And I said, did, did they give us anything? And someone said, they gave us some coffee and tea. <laughs> so, just, so that's... and. Um, what happened with, with our process was that regional council saw that it worked so well that they used that same template when they managed the, the um, floods that followed down at Edgecombe. So when the flooding was an Edgecombe emergency situation, they used the template that we had set up. Okay. And so, in summary... This is my own version of the outcome. I really like this research report. I like doing it. I love the sea. Like I'm a fisherman's daughter, uh, intergenerational fisher people. I just love the sea. It just takes my breath away when I see it. I remember um, I had students at Tuhua on Me Island and we were coming back and I was thinking, oh, there's rough weather coming. Shall we risk it? And it was a yacht. We were travelling on a yacht. And, um, and I thought, oh, some people would run out of smokes and mothers were missing their kids. I said, oh, well. And my brother, who's a fisherman, said, oh, you'll be all right because there's still fishing boats behind you coming in. So we came back and, oh, it was lovely. It was up and down, up and down and wet and salt in your mouth. And um, one of my students was doing her Hail Marys. And we got her back, back, got back in the harbour and they, and they said, thank God, fire, like this. And I said to the um, skipper, I said, well, was that rough? And he said, oh, it was about the second roughest I've ever been in. I said, oh, didn't realise it. I just love it. I love the sea. So, um, and for those 50 days, I experienced the freedom and power that come with mana motuhake, tino ranga tiratanga, and I got to record it. It was immensely satisfying. We held back any non makatu authority, governments, politicians, other iwi and other Māori. We did that. And, I, and we shouldn't need a disaster for ranga tiratanga to be experienced. And proof also that when we do believe in ourselves, when we do believe in ourselves, when we dare to take charge, we are unstoppable. Koina, that's me. <laughs> I mean, um, I've got one more picture. I, I, I told you about Ngāti and there was tapu involved. And I'll just give you a little bit. You, you might think I'm a bit batty, but I'll show you this bit. <laughs> eh? Okay. So, post, post the clean-up, it was quite um, uh, the environment, the social environment, the iwi environment was toxic. And um, Jack Thatcher said he was one of the ones that said the Rena 
sh wreck should be totally removed. We were ones that said, leave what's there, there at that time there. So we, we got bashed around a bit. So at the, uh, at, the, at the end of the court case, we had dinner at the Omanu Surf Club. So this is a picture taken from Omanu Surf Club. And see that little rainbow? Can you see a little rainbow in the middle of the picture? That's coming off Otaitu. And you know, as Māori, we look for signs, eh? That, that, for me, that was a sign. So right in the middle of the picture, there's a little, you can just see a rainbow, and it's, um, that's Otaitu coming from there. Yes, Kari. <laughs>